Hello, my name is John Foster. I'm an anesthesiologist at MUSC. I'm here to talk to you today about viscoelastic testing, TEG or thromboelastography, and ROTEM, rotational thromboelastometry. I have no disclosures to report. Brief history on viscoelastic testing. The two available viscoelastic testing products on the market are TEG, produced by Hemonetics, and ROTEM, produced by Werfen. TEG and ROTEM are based on the idea that the in vitro measurement of the viscoelastic properties of full blood as it clots in real time can identify in vivo abnormalities in clot formation and dissolution under low shear conditions. Both systems report the amount of rotational force that is applied to a sensor suspended in a cup of whole blood. The difference between the two is that in TEG, the cup is rotating around the sensor, and in ROTEM, the sensor rotates in the cup. Now, as the viscoelastic strength of the cup's contents increases as the blood begins to clot, the changes in the rotational forces acting on the wire are sensed, and this information is transmitted by an electromagnetic transducer and then processed to create thromboelastogram, which is then reported in real time. The newer ROTEM device, ROTEM Sigma, st still utilizes this rotating pin approach. However, the newer system for TEG, the TEG Success, now exposes the whole blood to a fixed vibration frequency and measures the vertical motion of the blood's meniscus. This correlates with the viscos, viscoelastic properties of the blood as it clots. In both systems, the newer ones are automated systems. So why utilize viscoelastic testing? So the main advantages of TEG and ROTEM over standard coagulation testing are, first allows for the global assessment of blood coagulation, the initiation, the strength of the clot, and the stability of the clot in vivo. These tests can identify abnormalities in the coagulation cascade, the contribution of the platelets and the fibrinogen to the clot strength, and the presence or absence of fibrinolysis. Both tests are available as a point-of-care test that can be rapidly performed and evaluated in real time, be it in the emergency department, the trauma bay, the operating room, or the blood bank. And lastly, these tests can guide transfusion therapy and the dynamic assessment of coagulation during active resuscitation. So both TAG and ROTEM are point-of-care methods that are often used in the setting of trauma and various surgeries, including obstetric surgery, liver transplant surgery, and cardiothoracic surgery in patients on cardiopulmonary bypass. And we're, in these scenarios, it's used to guide optimal blood product resuscitation. In these scenarios, ROTEM and TAG are shown to be superior to conventional coagulation testing for the identification, interpretation, and rapid correction of coagulation abnormalities. Systematic reviews on studies performed in cardiothoracic surgery patients have shown that TEG guided resuscitation reduces blood product usage, reduces postoperative chest re-exploration for surgical bleeding, and is also associated with reduced rates of acute kidney injury, ICU length of stay, and mortality. Multiple guidelines do recommend the use of viscoelastic testing to guide um, coagulation monitoring and resuscitation in these settings. NICE guidelines, the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence, recommend the use of TEG and or ROTEM to help detect, manage, and monitor coagulation abnormalities in cardiothoracic surgery patients. And then the European Society of Anesthesiologists, European Association of Cardiothoracic Surgery, European Association of Cardiothoracic Anesthesiologists, and American Society of Anesthesiologists all recommend viscoelastic testing to help guide the management of perioperative bleeding and coagulopathy. So the TEG parameters one must be familiar with in order to interpret and act on an abnormal TEG. First is the R time or the reaction time. This is the time from the initiation of the test until the initial fibrin formation begins. This phase is dependent on clotting factors and the presence of factor inhibitors. Next is the K time or the kinetics time. This is the time from the initiation of clot formation until the clot firmness reaches 20 millimeters. This phase is dependent on fibrin amplification and cross-linking as the thrombus begins to propagate. It's often called the thrombin or the fibrin burst phase. Next is alpha angle. This is the slope of the line imposed on the clot firmness graph between the end of the R time and the end of the K time. This angle is also dependent on fibrin, fibrin amplification and cross-linking as the thrombus begins to propagate. Next is the MA or the maximum amplitude. This is the overall Strength and stability of the clot is dependent primarily on platelets, around 80%, and fibrinogen, around 20%. Next is LY30, or the lysis at 30 minutes. This is the percentage decrease in the amplitude at 30 minutes relative to the maximum amplitude. It's dependent on the presence and severity of fibrinolysis. Standard tag tests to be familiar with. So the below four tests mentioned here are combined on a single cartridge for the newer tag 6 s system. The first test is the TEG-CK or KLN TEG. This utilizes KLN as an activator, 
and results information on coagulation initiation and kinetics, the R time, the K time, the off angle, the coagulation strength, max amp, and the clot stability, presence of or absence of lysis. Next test is the rapid tag, or the CRT. This utilizes tissue factor and KO lens activators. It does not provide information on coagulation kinetics, the R time as this is lost. However, information on clot strength, the max amp, is rapidly acquired, usually within 10 to 15 minutes of initiating the test. The CKH, or the k with heparinase, this additional test combines the CK tag with heparinase to neutralize any unfractionated heparin, either exogenous or endogenous in the patient. The CKH test is considered heparin neutral and has been validated for patients who are on, cardio, on cardiopulmonary bypass who are currently anticoagulated with heparin. And the last test is the functional fibrinogen test, or the CFF. This combines tissue factor for rapid activation that ignores coagulation kinetics with abcixumab, a GP2B3A inhibitor, to block platelet contribution to clot strength. When comparing the max amp results of CFF to CK or CRT, Real contributions of fibrinogen and platelets can be discerned. TAG also offers a platelet mapping test, determining if platelet inhibitors are present in the patient. This test separately adds arachidonic acid to ADP, which are both platelet activators, to the test resulting in platelet activation. However, the presence of platelet inhibitor medicines will inhibit platelet activation despite the presence of ADP and or arachidonic acid. The platelet mapping tests, when ordered, typically runs a cartridge with several tests included on it in order to assess overall coagulation and clot strength. First is a kaolin tag with heparinase to determine the baseline maximum amplitude. Next is a test called the activator F test, which is similar to the CFF test, to determine the fibrinogen's contribution to the maximum amplitude. Next two tests are run, one with ADP and arachidonic acid. The ADP test will determine the will test for the presence of a P2Y12 inhibitor, and the arachidonic acid will test for the presence of aspirin. And when comparing the maximum amplitude from the platelet activator test with that from the, C, the CKH heparinase test, it will determine whether or not platelet inhibitors are present. Now this test is important. Uh, it's been shown to be important in cardiothoracic surgery patients, especially those who require urgent cardiothoracic surgery in the setting of antiplatelet medicines. Most societies recommend about five days for platelets to wash out. However, it may not be known whether the patient was actually taking their P2Y12 inhibitor and how different patients might actually respond to these medicines. Objective measurement of ADP inhibition may reduce the waiting time for patients who require urgent cardiothoracic surgery. So ROTEM parameters one must be familiar with in order to interpret and act on an abnormal ROTEM. First is CT or clotting time. And this is the time from the start of the test until clotting begins. This initiation phase of clot formation is dependent on clotting factors and factor inhibitors. Next is CFT, or clot formation time. This is the time for the initiation of clotting until a clot firmness reaches 20 millimeters. This is dependent on fibrin amplification and cross-linking as the thrombus begins to propagate. MCF, or maximum clot firmness, is the overall strength and stability of the clot. Again, it's dependent on platelets, around 80%, and fibrinogen, around 20%. The lysis index, or the LI, is a reduction in clot firmness within 30 minutes or one hour after MCS is achieved relative to the original MCF value. It's dependent on the presence and or severity of fibrinolysis. Rotem has several tests to be familiar with. The first test is INTEN. This is a contact activation by exposure to phospholipids and ellagic acid. It provides information on coagulation kinetics for factors 1, 2, 5, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, similar to PTT. Next test available is XTEM. This is a tissue factor activation pathway. It provides information on coagulation kinetics for factors 1, 2, 5, 7, and 10, similar to PT. We also have a HEPTEM test. This combines INTEM with heparinase to neutralize any unfractionated heparin, either exogenous or exogenous, endogenous heparin. And by comparing the intent to heptem will allow the determination of heparin's effects. And again, this has been validated for patients on a cardiopulmonary bypass with heparin exposure. Next test is aptem. This combines XTEM with a protonin to inhibit fibrinolysis. Comparing aptem and XTEM will determine the will identify the presence of fibrinolysis and its severity. The last test is FibTEM. This combines XTEM with cytoclassin D, which is a platelet inhibitor, and determine the contribution of fibrinogen to clot strength. 
and by comparing FIBTEM to XTEM will allow determination of relative contributions of platelets and fibrogen to overall clot strength, the MCF. Comparing TEG and ROTEM. So despite the differences in design and the operating characteristics of each system, they do essentially provide the same information on clot initiation, clot kinetics, clot strength, and clot dissolution. However, the reported parameters and the normal ranges of said parameters are not interchangeable. A recent study comparing the two new generations of each system, the TEG 6S to, TEG to ROTEM Sigma in coagulopathic trauma patients, demonstrated that they deliver comparable results. However, there were differences between the two tests and the number of parameters outside of the normal range as provided by the manufacturers. And this brings up an important point. Um, current, currently, the established treatment algorithms used in surgery and trauma are based primarily on expert opinion and vary according to institution and or societal guidelines. And often these treatment triggers will differ from those provided by the manufacturer. The picture to the right demonstrates the functional overlap of the two basic tests and which parameters correspond with each on the TEG and ROTEM system. So how to interpret viscoelastic testing abnormalities? The first thromboelastogram presented is a normal tracing with all parameters within normal limits. Next one is a case of prolonged R time or CT time due to coagulation factor deficiency, factor inhibitors, or the presence of anticoagulants. You can see the R time is significantly prolonged relative to the original tracing. Next is a case of residual heparin. In this test, heparinase is added to the original test either with a CKH or a heptin, and the R time or CT time is compared to the same test without the heparinase. A decrease in the R CT time associated with the addition of heparinase suggests that there is residual heparin that may benefit from additional reversal. In this specific example, the green tracing is the heparinase and the red tracing is that without heparinase. You can see the R time and or CT time are significantly different between the two. Next two cases are cases of decreased clot strength, the max amp or the MCF are low, due to either platelet dysfunction or deficiency or fibrinogen deficiency. Now you can further elucidate if fibrinogen is the issue here by looking at the K time or the CFT time, which will often be prolonged, and the alpha angle, which will often be low. And they can further evaluate with fibrinogen specific testing, such as CFF or FibTEM. In the last case, this tracing shows hyperfibrinolysis. So there's increased lysis, lysis in this patient after initial max AM has been achieved due to acute or chronic hyperfibrinolysis. So viscoelastic testing in cardiothoracic surgery. Uh, coagulopathy in cardiac surgery is common, present in around 20% of cases, and it's often multifactorial. It can be due to hemodilution, activation of the extrinsic pathway due to exposure to tissue factor, activation of the intrinsic pathway from exposure of blood to circuit components, or potential for residual heparin despite protein reversal. These pathological processes, pathological processes lead to reduction in fibrogen and platelets, reduced platelet function due to degranulation, depletion of coagulation factors, and hyperfibrinolysis. Viscoelastic testing often reveals one or more abnormalities, including prolonged clotting times, reduced clot strength and firmness, the presence of residual heparin, and increased hyperfibrinolysis. While the manufacturers report their own normal values for the tests, one should utilize institutional or societal guidelines to guide blood product resuscitation, which is often based on expert opinion. Additionally, one should repeat viscoelastic testing and standard coagulation testing throughout the resuscitation process in order to guide further resuscitation and determine the efficacy of ongoing interventions. This last slide presents SCA and EACA guidelines regarding cutoffs for normal and abnormal tag and rotin parameters that may be seen during cardiothoracic surgery. The figures to the right presents treatment guidelines for specific abnormalities from the SCA. So this is the sources I used to create this presentation. Thank you for taking time to listen to this discussion on this classic testing. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. There's my email. It's jof49.mc.edu. Thank you. Have a good day.